Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ian Fennelly's 90-minute demonstration of his urban sketching technique, Layers of Looking. My name is Heather Atherton, and I'm the alumni director and your host from the Madeline Island School of the Arts, heretofore called MISA. And I'm joining you from the shores of Lake Superior at our flagship campus, which you can see behind me. We are thrilled to have Ian, one of our international instructors, artist, and author, joining us from the UK. Welcome, Ian. Hi, Heather. Thank you. Lovely, to, lovely to see you. Lovely to see you too. Thank you so much for joining us. We're just thrilled you're that you're welcome. here. You're so welcome. Okay, so I am going to, okay, we are good. All right, so how this is gonna work folks is the, the reference photo link of the Seligman building that Ian's gonna be working on is going to be put in our chat box. I'm being told I need to push record here. Let's see. Oh, I, I am recording. Okay, wonderful. Sorry about that little hiccup there. Um, so the reference link is going to be put in the chat box. It's also available on our Facebook page and Instagram page. After this wonderful demonstration, there will be a link to our YouTube channel where you can view this and you can pause it and catch up with Ian as he sketches along. We also have two MISA panelists, Megan and Kate, who are going to be monitoring the chat box. Also, if you have any questions, please go ahead and click the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and enter those questions. They'll feed those over to me and I can interrupt Ian while he's sketching to get answers to your burning questions. Um, near the end, I'll share a bit about MISA and the classes that Ian is teaching with us. So with that, I will hand it right over to you, Ian. Thank you, Heather. Can I, can I just thank everybody for joining me today? And I would say it's lovely to see you, but I can't see you, but I know you're all there. So thank you so much. I hope you really enjoy this, this demonstration today. Now, I, um, I know that a lot of you are probably going to be working alongside me and seeing this as a workshop which is absolutely fine and i and i love that i love the fact that you're you're doing that as well and i'm obviously mindful that some of you are just going to sit and watch now those of you that are going to work alongside me um just be aware that i do work really quickly and there are no gaps there's no pauses so not like my normal workshops where i will i will, I will pause in between and let you catch up I'm not going to do that today because it's really a demonstration. OK, so all of you lovely artists all over the world who are going to be working alongside me, just make sure you're going to be working quickly because I'm working quickly today because I've got a lot to get through. Now, as you've seen or hopefully as you've seen from the, the reference photograph, it's, um, it's a hardware store on Route 66 in Arizona in a place called Seligman, which is just not that I've ever been there, but it looks amazing. And the idea behind this subject is that I want to try and capture, from my point of view, Americana, because this is just old America with all the signs and all the stuff outside. If you look carefully, you can see there's an airplane that's crashed into the front facade of the building, which is just crazy. And it's got loads and loads of signs, um, mainly to do with coffee and caffeine and that kind of stuff. But it's really telling a story and it's an amazing story. And the whole idea about drawing and painting on location is that you get a chance to tell your own story. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to break this down into lots and lots of steps to tell the story of this place. And it doesn't matter that I've not been there. And it doesn't really matter that I'm using a reference photograph because as the world is at the moment, you know, I'm not allowed to travel. They won't let me on an airplane anywhere. So I've just got to use this photograph. So it's the next best thing which which is which is fine so what I'm going to do today is because I've only got 90 minutes and it's going to hopefully go really quickly what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off just by breaking up the space on the page just by placing some pens on to really describe 
the outside edge of, of the building. So as you look at the hardware store, it's just the outside edge of the building that I'm going to place the pens on just to mark out the four, four sides. Okay, the top, the bottom and the two, the two sides. That's the first thing I'm going to do. And that is a really important step because that enables me to visualize how it's going to fit on the page. Then I'm going to sketch it out very, very loosely and lightly with a Tombow brush pen, this one that I've got in my hand at the moment, which is 65, okay, N65. Then I'm going to go over it again with the permanent fine liners to give myself some more information, okay? And then the final stage is a bit like chucking everything at it. I'm going to put the detail on, I'm going to put the colour on, I'm going to put the tone on. I'm going to kind of roll all of that into one step. Now, normally, normally on a proper workshop, which hopefully some of you are going to come and join me with, on a proper workshop, I would break that final step down into loads and loads of steps, but I haven't got time to do it today. So the final step is going to be a bit of everything all rolled into one, which is going to be super, super fun. So just to let you know, this sheet of paper that you can see on the screen here is 40 centimetres by, by 30 centimetres. So I think, I think it's 16 inches by 12 in kind of old money. So it's a big, big sheet of paper. So for that reason, it's kind of really important to break that space up first of all. And what I do is I place the pens on. OK, so let me show you how, how it's going to work. As you look at the photograph on the left hand side where you've got the aeroplane sticking out, that is the side edge there. OK, and it's not perfectly straight. That's perfectly straight, but this is going to bend in. So already I'm telling a story of this building. This is where it drops down. This is the bottom here. And then this is the other side. We use a slightly smaller pen for that. And that's how it fits on the page. Now, in reality, if I was to shift it over to the right slightly and look at it, it would be a perfect rectangle. It would look like that. But that hasn't got the same character. That hasn't got the drama. That hasn't got the personality. So what we're doing is we're just ever so slightly bending things a little bit. And that's partly to do with the angle because we've shifted over to the left slightly, but it's also to do with creating some drama and some character already on the page. The idea behind this, if you look at the photograph, there is, it's full of stories. It's full of signs, it's got an old car, it's got an old chair in the foreground, it's got those like amazing signs, like how far it is to Amarillo and all these kind of places. Um, it's got a clock on the side, it's got um, an American flag in the window, it's got Route 66 on the floor. That's all telling a story. And that story is going to fit inside this shape. Okay, so here we go, guys. That's step one, which doesn't really count as a proper step. Okay, and this is sketching it out now. So here we go N65 brush pen, bringing this down here. Yeah back up to there, very, very lightly. I'm holding the pen really loosely at this stage, just marking out these really simple shapes. Okay, hope you can see that all right. Now we're gonna have a plumb line going right down the middle. This is that kind of kinky structure. It goes right down the middle there, like that, okay? Got this nice little detail on top here. This bit just sticks out slightly. There, this comes out here. So just very, very loose at this stage. Then we've got a sign that sticks up here, one of like many. And this is going to come a little bit further over. That comes down there. As Heather said before, guys, if anybody's got any questions, please ping them in the chat box and Heather can ask me. Because otherwise, what I'll do, I'll just keep talking and talking and talking. Probably end up losing the concentration. So in this space here, we're going to have the car. Now let's do this aeroplane. This is just so random. Check out this aeroplane, guys. Sticking out here. 
So cool. Fantastic, look at that. Brilliant. Because this pen is water soluble, when I put the paint on later, a lot of the lines that I don't really want at this stage because I'm just kind of exploring the composition, a lot of these lines will actually disappear. So I'm not too worried at this stage. So these are all the distance signs there. That's cool, I like that. We'll just do the outline of the car. It's just amazing how all these things are just sitting outside, just telling such a great story. This is the doorway here. Now over on this side, you'll see there's an awful lot of stuff. It looks a bit like a jumble sale. Now it's very, very cluttered this part of the scene. So I probably won't put too much in here. Otherwise it is gonna look a little bit of a jumble. So I'll just select a few different elements because you don't wanna draw everything. You wanna select, you wanna edit things in and edit things out all the time. here on the floor, which I'm really excited about. And I know I shouldn't get excited about these kind of things, but it says root 60, no, it doesn't say root 66, it says root US. So I've got to get that in. And it's got that like amazing shape that kind of goes around it, just there. So I love, I love that, I'm really happy about that. Okay, now that is probably all I'm gonna do the step one and it's a very very loose outline no detail it's not neat it's not tidy but it's got a few really really important lines this line here which is on a very slight angle this line here okay which is communicating with it across the page this one which has given us the perspective this one here which is also given us perspective so in some ways that is the outline, that is my page, my blank page, which I'm now gonna populate for the rest of this demonstration with storytelling and detail. Ian, I do have a quick question for you. So why did you choose this photo and Route 66 to highlight today? Okay, well, when I come over to Wisconsin in a couple of months time, one of the things I'm gonna be really intrigued by is what makes America and specifically Wisconsin different from what I normally see in the UK and in Europe. So obviously Route 66 doesn't go through Wisconsin, even I know that, but it's this kind of Americana from my point of view, okay? And I don't wanna sound patronizing, but it's, it's what I think, it, what I see as, as interesting and, and different. So for example, I love the facade of the building. I love the shape of the building. I love the signage on the building. And I know you're not gonna get that wherever you go, but what intrigues me, what fascinates me is the potential for telling stories. And that's something I love to do in my sketches. So when I go to Madeline Island and we go to um, you know, the island, we go to Bayfield, which is the, the port nearby, I'm gonna be looking for things, not like this, but things similar which enable me to tell the story of the place and the things that I find really fascinating and interesting and that's kind of what you do as an artist you know you're always looking for stories and this was just had great storytelling potential so this is now the next step guys this is like step three this is going to take a lot longer because I'm going to now add a lot more information to the sketch it's very very loose at the moment and I'm going to use a point three permanence 
fine line. Okay, I'm just going to get a few outs. These are all point threes. They're not different, but I've got a few just just in case they run out, which we don't want to do. And I'm going to start. I can start anywhere with this sketch, but I'm just going to start off in the middle here. Okay, I'm just going to start off with this. Looks like a doorway where they would throw things out. You just get the doorway in. Sketching this really, really quickly. It's quite loose at this stage. Sketch that in there, and that's quite cute. I like that. Okay, and then we'll do the plane. Got to be really careful with this plane because what you don't want to do is is make it look kind of ambiguous. I like ambiguity, but I want to kind of control it. So I want it. I want to make sure it looks like. A plane and it doesn't look like a kind of random shape sticking sticking out of the building which in some ways it probably is hopefully that kind of looks a bit like a plane okay the side of the building coming down here and this is a, a kind of anchor line because this line going across here is perfectly horizontal it's almost like an anchor line it's anchor, anchoring everything together and then we've got a massive beer here that looks rather nice Now, I'm going to put gifts in here. Now, a little um, tip that I often often show people is rather than putting the rectangle and then trying to squeeze the lettering in, do the lettering first, because you know you can fit that in, and then just put the rectangle around it. It's so much easier. And then we've got a clock here, which is rather cool. I like the clock, and it's got a kind of funny shape coming out there. And then it's got jewellery which is spelt differently from how we spell it in the UK. But I kind of prefer this way because it's shorter and it means I can fit it in, which is rather handy. And then we do the rectangle around there. And then we've got something there. I think it probably says coffee because just about everything else says coffee, but I can't quite fit that in, but never mind, that doesn't matter. Because you don't have to fit everything in. Right, and this says Route 66. So I'll just do the beginning of the R, O, U, T, E 66 and then historic. I love lettering. The lettering hopefully will look a lot better than this towards the end, but I'm just marking it out at the moment. This is just making sure I get it all in. So Ian, we out. have a question from Nigel Smith who wants to know how do you know when to stop sketching detail before starting with ink? And what are your guidelines? Okay. Great, great question. That's a Brilliant question. Was that was that Nigel? That was Nigel Smith. Yes. OK, so Nigel, the, the idea is, is at this stage, you're mindful of what's going to happen next. So what's going to happen next is I'm going to put the colour on. So I need to make sure I've got enough information down, not too much. You don't want to really focus on too much detail, but you want to put enough information down so you know kind of where the colour is going to go. Now, at the moment, I can't really put the colour on because what will happen, all this will wash away. And because of the nature of this particular sketch, because there's a lot of specific detail, I want to kind of record quite a bit of that. So like, for example, I'm, I'm doing the little pole behind the signs here, and I kind of need to put that in before the colour goes on, because otherwise I wouldn't really know where the colour was going to go. And I need to do something on this side. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to do like a little bit of a picket fence. Now, I know it's not a picket fence, it's like a really ugly looking pink wall. So this is just a cheat, because this is just kind of framing that side of the picture, which is absolutely fine. So in answer to your question, it's, it's how much you need to put down before you're going to put the next stage on, which is, in this case, the colour. And in some drawings, it depends, again, on the, the actual subject that you're doing, because for some drawings, I would probably do a lot less drawing than this. But because of the nature of this one, because there's such a lot of stuff that you want to get in, you probably have to do a lot more recording before 
you put the colour on. So I hope that kind of answers your question. This is just great fun. I am loving this. And if, if I was actually here now, not that I could because they'd never let me in the country, this is kind of how I would do it. This is, this is the subject I would choose, and this is how I'd go about doing it. So as I'm working from a photograph, I'm trying to simulate the way in which I would draw if I was actually there in reality. And that just comes from, you know, having done it quite a few times before, actually on location. Now there's a really cute little chair sticking up here which you want to put in. Check out this chair, it's so cute. So there's the chair, looks like it's got like a little arm there. Okay, and that's nice because that just links this space at the bottom quite nicely. Now we have coffee, there's so much caffeine going on here. So we've got coffee like that. And then we've got Java, and then we've got Espresso. And then we've got another coffee. And then we've got something, I've no idea what this is. No idea, it looks like JT, but I'm sure it's not JT. And then I'm gonna put some rectangles around it. Thanks, love. That was great timing, just as I was talking about coffee, my dear wife just came in with a coffee for me. <laughs> so you see, it makes a lot more sense to put the lettering in first and then fit the rectangles, fit, fit the rectangles around it. And then we've got the doorway here. And it looks like we've got a bin there and then a box thing there. This is just great fun to do. I mean, I've never, I've never ever, ever drawn anything like this before. I mean, I've done kind of similar things to this, which I'll show you later, but never anything quite like this. And it's it's so exciting and it just kind of makes you want to go there. I want to be along Route 66. I do too, Ian. And we have a question from Eli who wants to know, does Ian ever use pencils? And if not, when and how did you stop? Okay, right, great question. Thanks, Eli. Um, right, so the answer, the short answer is no, I never use, I never use pencil. Um, well, I've not used pencil for a long, long time. Um, and the reason I don't use pencil is because I always feel that if I've got a pencil in one hand, I've got a rubber in the other. So I spend half my time, instead of drawing, I spend half my time rubbing things out. And that's because I think if you've got a pencil, it's a little bit like a safety net. So you don't try, or at least I don't try as hard. I don't think as hard. And that's just a personal thing. I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with using the pencil. And if you do use a pencil, guys, please carry on using them. You know, don't stop using them because of, because of what I say. It's just a personal thing for me. I find if I've got a pen in my hand, it's much more of a commitment. And I, and I try a lot harder. So when students come on my, on my workshops, I'll encourage them to use a pen. I mean, if they don't want to use a pen at first, maybe for the first workshop and they want to use a pencil, then that's absolutely fine. But I try and encourage them to dispense with the pen after a while, sorry, the pencil after a while and, and use a pen. Because I, I just think you, you concentrate, you think a lot harder. And it's that kind of deliberate commitment, you know, right at the beginning, you're, you're just committing yourself to the activity. So great, great question, thank you. So this is the area where there's an awful lot of kind of junk 
going on. So I don't want to get too bogged down with this area here. And we have a question from Juliet who says, sorry, missed whether the 0.3 pen is water soluble or permanent. Yeah. This is permanent. So this, this is a permanent pen now because obviously the next stage, I'm going to be putting the color on. So I don't want these lines to disappear. The first one was water soluble, but it won't disappear completely. And you'll still see some of these gray lines coming through from the, the N65 brush pen. But these lines now with the fine liner, these, these are all, these are all permanent, all permanent. Okay, now what I'm gonna have to do, guys, I'm gonna have to turn my page round and let me explain why. If you look at the paneling, if you look at that gorgeous kind of cobalt turquoise paneling, it's all made up of wooden slats coming across, and I need to draw them, and it's really tricky doing it horizontal. So I'm going to have to whiz my page round if that's okay, so I can draw them coming coming across. Okay, so I'm just going to turn it that way. Okay, hopefully you can see it okay. And I'm just going to draw a line there and there. So it's just so much easier, I find to sort of do them vertically, you know, coming coming towards you. You want these lines to be quite, quite straight, really. It'd be silly to do them wobbly. Let come over here, let's just shift them up a little bit. Trouble is you have to keep kind of looking back again to make sure you don't go over things that you shouldn't go over, like gifts. So Ian, a question from Penny, who wants to, Hi, Penny. <laughs> she wants to know how does sketching from a photo differ from sketching in person? Oh my goodness, Penny, that like, how long have you got? Dear me, that, that's just the, the best question ever. And I, I could talk about this for ages and ages and ages. Um, okay, so I, before COVID came along, and we all know what COVID is, is horrible thing that's kind of taken over the world before covid came along nearly all of my work was done outside on location but obviously since say march of last year i've not been able to travel so i've had to work from photographs and it is a very very different experience the outcome penny isn't exact isn't very different so if you looked on my instagram accounts you wouldn't really be able to tell what was done from a photo and what was done um, on location because I, I can kind of simulate the experience. So, for example, if I was sitting now in Seligman and drawing this picture, it would kind of look a bit like what I'm drawing at the moment. It wouldn't look very different. What would be massively different is my experience of, of doing it. Not so much my enjoyment because I, I, I enjoy it either way around, but it's a different experience. Um, because you, you, you'd be with people, you'd be talking to people, you'd be, you know, understanding the kind of the culture of the place, and you'd be, you know, going and eating in, in, in the bars and the restaurants, and you'd be, you know, just experiencing the whole the whole atmosphere. And that would come out in your work. And it's hard to describe how it would come out in your work. You don't really know how it would come out unless you were actually you're actually there. On that subject, let me just show you the sketch. I did this, I did this in New Orleans last couple of years ago, okay? Now this was drawn on location. This was a workshop piece on location. And this, this isn't any different from what this picture is gonna be in many, many ways. It's, it's the same sort of thing. It's this kind of facade, it's this, this structure, all these colors, all this storytelling, all this layering, all the lettering. So in some ways, the outcome is kind of the same. It's a different experience of doing it. And I think I, I've learned a lot of my, well, all my techniques, all my ways of, of doing what I do through working outside. And then I just apply them to working from photographs. See, another huge big difference I told you, you shouldn't have asked me this question. I'll be, I'll be talking about this now for the next hour. 
And um, another huge big difference is that on a photograph, when you walk from a photograph, you've only got a limited amount of information. I mean, I've only got what the photograph can tell me. But if you're on location, you can actually scan the scene and you can bring things into the scene which you, you don't necessarily see. So a, a really good example would be here in this corner here. I kind of I'm a bit stuck because there's not an awful lot apart from the junk. But what I might do is I might look, say, three meters over to the right and see something really cool, like a cute little fire hydrant or a bin or another chair. And I can just move it into the scene. And you can't do that from a photo because you don't know what's on that corner because the photographer hasn't photographed it. I'm not, I'm not blaming the photographer. It's just life. That's just the way it is. So, yeah, in answer to your question, there's loads of differences. We have another question. This one is from Graham, who says, it's really interesting that you use the word vague to describe the line work, but there's an accuracy to everything that's going on to the page. I'd love to hear more about your journey to discovering this balance in the way you work. Oh, wow. What, what was the, the actual question there, Heather? So the question thing. is, um, they want to know more about the journey to finding the balance um, between this vagueness you're talking about okay. and the balance of the accuracy in everything that's going on the page. So okay. how you balance that out. Right. So, okay, my... My, my drawings are, are really accurate in the sense they're exactly what I want to do. <laughs> this, this is how I want to draw. And I do distort things and I do exaggerate things because what I'm trying to do is tell a story. And I want this story to be very vivid and very bold and very dramatic. And I want it to kind of jump out at people. Look, this is the story of what I see. So everything I do, all the lines I use, all the distortion, all the you know, just the dramatization of everything is all done for a reason. Because, you know, I'm telling a particular story. I'm just doing a quick little building extension here. I know there's a cowboy, or it looks like a kind of cowboy fella here. I'm not putting him in because he'll just look a bit odd. He'll look like a real person. But I'm just want to extend the building down a bit. And yeah, so everything's done for a reason. And it's, it's just, a, it's a balance. It's a balance between, you know, obviously, referencing what you see in real life and trying to make it accurate and accurate depiction but also at the same time it's a piece of art which has to kind of speak for itself as well and to clarify grant's or excuse me graham's question um how do you keep the perspective so tight even though the sketch feels and looks very loose ah. wow that's that's a hot these are really hard questions heather can I have an easy question like what pen are you using? <laughs> These are really hard. Um, you'll, have to, you'll have to come on a workshop for that one. I'm sorry, I can't answer that in a demo. That's that's a workshop answer. I'm sorry. It's 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 years of practice and it's it's thinking, you know, you're thinking really, really hard. You're not just switching off and just doodling away. You're really thinking hard and, and everything, you're doing everything for a reason. So how things fit on the page, how things sit on the page. Everything's done for a reason. Some lines you can bend. This line can be bent, okay? This line can be bent. This line can't. That has to be horizontal. Otherwise, it'll just throw everything out. Okay, and that, everybody, is probably all I'm going to do for step I think it's step three, I've lost count. Step number three. Anyway, it's the fine liner step. Because I want to move on to the, the final step, which is going to take nearly an hour. And this is called chucking everything at the picture step. Normally it'd be broken down into lots of steps. But because it's a demo, I'm going to do painting and then more drawing and then probably a bit more painting and a bit of tone work with the brush pen. So I'm just going to kind of do a little bit of everything really. And I'm really excited about this because I've got some really cool colors. These are the colors that I'm going to be using. Okay. So I'm going to use cobalt turquoise light, obviously, because it's cobalt turquoise light. Cerulean blue, because towards the bottom, 
down here, it kind of gets a bit more cerulean bluey, it gets a bit bluey, okay? Winds are blue, just to give me some kind of darker tones. Burnt sienna, because it's my favorite color and I wanna use it. Cadmium yellow, because all those signs, those like million and one coffee signs are cadmium yellow. Quinacridone red, but we'll just call it quin red for now. I mean, try saying that when you've had a few beers, okay? Quinacridone red. I'm gonna use quin red, because if I mix that with white, because that's a kind of pinky red, it's going to give me the kind of the pinky structure, so the bin and this horizontal first floor here and some of the other bits of junk. And I'm also going to use black and I'm also going to use white. Let me show you the brushes. We have five brushes today. Big flat brush, medium flat brush, baby flat brush, big rigger, number three rigger and a zero rigger normally on a workshop i take loads of brushes with me but i never use them so it's not really much point it just makes me look like a proper artist but i never use like five so i'm only going to use five today there's like no point in having any more because you don't want to make it too complicated these are the paints these are winsor newton paints okay and all the colors are in here i <laughs> just have to try and remember which ones i've said i'm going to use <laughs> So um, that's Windsor Blue, I think. That's Cerulean. That's obviously Cobalt Turquoise Light. That's Quin Red, Quinacridone Red. That's Cadmium Yellow, and that is Burnt Sienna. This is my little water tub here, okay? And I'm gonna just give them a little spray now to wake them up, because I've not used them for a while. So really give them a good little soaking, and it, it wakes them up. I mean, they hate it. They get really annoyed, but you know, you've got to do it, otherwise they, they just won't come out to play. Um, I'm going to get my water tub here. Massive big industrial water tub, you need lots of water. And I'm ready to paint. What I will do, because I know a lot of you working alongside, I will just pause for a second while you get your paintbrushes out. <laughs> and I'm going to start off. It's, there's, there's like there's two ways I could start this. I could start off with the yellow and kind of get all the yellow in. But I think I'll get a bit bored doing that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little bit of the yellow. And then I'm going to go on to the Cobalt Turquoise Light and probably mix a bit of the blue in with that and then maybe do some of the pink as well. So I'm just going to really bounce around. So rather than doing all the yellow and then doing all the Cobalt Turquoise, because I know I'd get bored, I'm just going to do a little bit of all the colours and just keep bouncing around all the time. So I'm very excited about this, guys. So here we go, yellow. Look at that, gorgeous. Stunning. Just jet down a little bit because I'm putting so much pressure on with the brush. The page is moving. So let me just take that at the bottom for you there. Okay, so here we go. Kathy. Java. Espresso. Coffee. And goodness knows what that says. Okay, this has got white in, I mixed a bit of white in. Uh, just have a few splashes as we can, and then gifts here and jewelry. And then this is the pink. So this is the quinacridone red. Not quite the same pink, but I really don't mind. It probably works better with these colours using this pink. Gorgeous, look at that. Wow. In fact, looking at the photo, it's absolutely nothing like this colour. But I really don't care. That's not important. So not matching colours like that. Ian, we have a question from Megan. What is your favourite Bruce Springsteen song? 
Oh, that's Megan. That's such a great question. That's an easy one. Megan, you're just brilliant. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, it used to be, it used to always be um racing, racing in the streets. But um I kind of like Atlantic City. I think that's my favourite at the moment. I mean, I do play Bruce Springsteen on the guitar really badly. Uh, appallingly badly, I'm afraid. But thank you for that, Megan. That was such a great question. So, guys, any more questions, please? Can we kind of have them to do with Bruce Springsteen? Because it's so much easier. Yeah, than asking me things like perspective and wonky lines. Now, I've got to be careful that this doesn't end up being an illustration. And that's the danger. You know, you just end up painting all these shapes and it just gets really boring. So I want the colours to have a little bit of a life of their own. So I'm introducing some of this cerulean blue now. With a little bit of this cobalt turquoise. Look at that. Gorgeous. Stunning. But I find, Bruce, on the subject of Bruce Springsteen, because that's so much easier to talk about, Bruce Springsteen, I find really inspiring. I mean, I'm, I'm just totally inspired by music and musicians and artists, musical artists and what, what they say and the stories they tell. I just, I just find them just brilliant. Because really, I, I didn't want to be an artist when I, was, when I was younger. I wanted to be in U2. But they didn't ask me. I was like, just so disappointed. I mean, oh, yeah. I don't blame them because I can't play an instrument. I can't sing. But it would have been nice to have been asked. Ian, we seem to have lost your camera that's on your touchpad. Okay. Let me just go back and go. Okay. Let me just turn it around. There we go. How's that? Wonderful. Thank you so much. Now, Heather, what might happen is it might just keep timing out a little bit now. For some reason, my, my camera phone does that. I don't know why. Okay. So every now and then, all I need to do is tap it. So every now and then, could you just say, Ian, tap your phone? Absolutely. All right, brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so a little bit of burnt sienna now going on, mixed with a bit of Windsor blue, just to get some nice dark tones inside here, just to give it a bit more tonal variety. Is it gone again? Yep, it's just gone again. <laughs> and there we are. So Sorry Ian, about that. that's just fine. On your new book, Layers of Looking, uh, we have a question here from Kate. And Kate wants to know what's with the 007 on the satellite, which is on the cover image of your new book, Layers of Looking. Ah, right. Good question. Um, so that, that cover is the plasters, that's the pub nearest to where I live. It's literally about two minutes away from my house. And for some reason, they've got a satellite dish and it's just got 007 on it. So I just copied it, which is, I just thought was really cool. I don't know why they've got 007. But that's very, very observant, really well spotted.
there's a question from Sarah who wants to know, does Ian ever wait, wait for paint to dry or does he just paint continuously? No, I do. I do wait for, for it to dry. Um, but if it's a demonstration like today, obviously I, I don't because if we did a, a 90 minute demo and 20 minutes of the demonstration was spent waiting for the paint to dry, <laughs> it would be a bit boring. And you'd all be thinking, why would we bother turning up for this? So I'm going straight in with it. So normally I would I would just let things dry a little bit. Not not too much. You don't need to be dry completely. But yeah, I would I would let things dry a little bit. But obviously I can't really do that today. So I've just gone straight in. So that would be something that attendees would experience during, say, a workshop with you? Yeah, absolutely. So on a, on a workshop, I mean, the, the workshops go on for about four hours. You know, they, they take a lot longer and we have we have breaks in between. So you get plenty of opportunity to let the paint dry and we can really slow things down and just take our time. Um, so this is just really a flavour of my process of how we go about doing things. But also it gives you a, a bit of an insight into the steps that I take, you know, how I how I break it down and and also the, the subjects that I would choose, because these are typically the subjects that really appeal to me. You know, almost like the big, the big ticket items, the, the things that, you know, I've got lots and lots of really good storytelling potential. So Ian, if students join you for a workshop, say the, the one in July on Madeline Island what would they expect as far as demos and how long those are going to last? Maybe a little bit of the format. Okay. So it would take obviously all day, you know, we're talking about four, four, maybe five hours. Um, it's all broken down into lots of steps, similar to what we've done today. Um, and, you know, we would, I, we would just go looking or I would just go looking for, subjects that I just find really appealing, really interesting with lots and lots of, you know, just storytelling potential. You know, so if there's any old cars, the old main streets, the, I know there's a gorgeous barn there as well, which we'll sketch and maybe get some old fences in and some gate posts. And then I think down in, in is it Bayfield where we've got the, um, the harbour, we'll find some old fishing boats. So it, it will just be great fun, can't wait. And, you know, each, each workshop is, is different. Each one, you know, will find a different story to tell. It's never the same story. I'm sure we'll find a lot of stories here on Madeline Island for you to, to capture, as well as, you know, you'll be with us in Santa Fe in March, and that's a whole different landscape. Have you, have you worked with the Southwest landscape before? No, I haven't. I haven't. No. And and what's what's magic about these sort of things is you never quite know what you're going to find until you get there. You don't quite always know what the stories are going to be. You, you think you might know what they are, but there's always something that, that jumps out that you don't you don't quite expect. And that's what I think is just magical about about doing this thing that, you know, you're on a, a journey of discovery yourself, even though you know the process, and you know what you're teaching and you know how it's all going to be broken down. You know, you're still excited and you're still learning and discovering things yourself. And hopefully that comes across in the teaching. You know, I've got to be just as excited as, as everybody else, because, you know, one of the things I, I use as a, as, a, as a teaching tool is just my, my enthusiasm, you know, my interest for the whole thing. Well, that certainly so. comes through. And we have a question from Pepper who asks, does Ian prefer wet on dry or wet on wet painting? That's a great question. I, I, like, I like both and I, and I kind of do both as well. So at the moment it's kind of wet on wet because, because of the speed I'm working and I've kind of got to work wet on wet. But sometimes it's more of a layering process. And again, on a workshop, we'll have the time to do a layering process. You know, we can wait for the first stage of the watercolors dry and then we can apply more layers to it. So a lot of my drawings will involve working wet on wet and also a lot of them will involve, you know, waiting for things to dry and then do more of a kind of layering, a layering thing. 
And it just, it just varies. It very much depends on the subject, what the subject demands, um, how much time you've got. Also the drying conditions as well. I mean, I've, I've worked in, in some parts of the world where it's just been incredibly hot and things dry like straight away. As soon as you put the paint on, it's dry. Which, you know, you don't, know, you don't always want because you don't quite get the same vibrancy. The pigments seem to kind of like dissolve into the paper. All right, we have a question from Natalie who wants to know, how do you pick where to put a local color versus loose colors that could be quite different from the reality? That's a great question, brilliant. Okay, so with this one, the local color is obviously the yellow and the turquoise, okay? And, and they're, they kind of, they are dictated very much by the reason you're, you're doing this, this scene in the first place. So if I didn't do it cobalt, turquoise lights and, and yellow you can argue well what's the point in doing this scene you know if you're not going to pay some kind of reference to the actual specific dramatic very you know distinctive colors but then there's other colors like what's happening here which are much more kind of what, what we call emotive you know they're 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 there to balance the picture you know they're there to tell the story they're there to show that human elements they're yeah. there to you know show your you there to show your imagination all those sort of things i meant to tap it before three five six okay there we go there we go thank you it's all right Oh, I've just seen a question here from Monica. Between hot press and cold press. I prefer hot press because it's, it's smoother. Let me just center that for you. There we go. Yeah, I, I, pref I much prefer um, hot press paper. Right, so let's go in now with some of the detail. Just love lettering, such fun. So Ian, what techniques ch do you change when you are working plein air? That's a anonymous question. Um, I don't think I change any techniques. It's more about the experience and what you actually see um so the actual technique the process will be very very similar i, I imagine anyway i don't i don't i don't think I'm, i don't consciously change the technique or or the, the way i put things together it's it's more like an attitude of, of, of mind and the fact that you're recording the same three-dimensional space that you're sitting in Wow, that grey looks nice. So these are these are the very light grey brush pens now. And what's lovely about these is because they're water soluble, they will just lift some of the colour underneath, kind of push it around. So Ian, another person wants to know when did you fall in love with urban sketching? Right. Well, I've, I've always I've always drawn. I've always been an artist all, all my life. Started off as a as a baby artist um, many, many years ago. And I've always drawn cityscapes all my life. I've, I've drawn cities, and painted them and sketched them. And for a long time, all I did was watercolour painting. I was a kind of watercolour artist for many, many years. But then running alongside that, I've always drawn as well. And then about six seven years ago i just kind of connected the two together um so i've always drawn outside i've always been engaged in, in recording cities i've always painted i've always drawn so you know being an urban sketcher is just the kind of natural 
natural development of all of that, I guess. And someone wants to know, why does Ian use the Thambo gray instead of painting gray? That's a good question. Okay, because, and it, that's, it's a speed thing in some ways, because you see now I've finished all the painting. So I don't really want to introduce any more wet to it. So by using the brush pen, I can still build up tones and, you know, to some extent colour, if you think of grey as being colour, but I'm not introducing any water. So it's enabling me to carry on building up the image, but there's no issues with drying, there's no kind of drying time. And also I think that the, the negative, all the kind of neutral values with the grey brush pens, I think just really complement the colour that's gone on. And Natalie would like to know, um, do you put the Tombos on dry watercolors, but on wet too? Both, yeah, they're going on both. Yeah, so at the moment, they're going on some wet areas of color, and they're all going, also going on some dry areas of color. And that's, that's why I like the water soluble quality of them, because you can buy um, alcohol based ones, which are um, not water soluble, they're permanent but they're not as compatible with painting. I've tried them and they just, they just don't sit very well. And Philip would like to know, why do you choose adding white to a color instead of desaturating it? Because if you add white to it, what you're, what you're doing is you're making the paint thicker. So therefore it takes less time to dry. So I could have achieved the pink just by using the Queen Gold with more water, but it would, it would stay wetter and you can't control it as well. What, what the white is doing is it's because it's making the, um, the paint slightly more opaque. It just means you can control it better. So it's more of a kind of a desire, you know, a, a kind of a, a, an outcome that I want because I know I can control it better. I mean, you almost get the same effect, but it's just easier to control by adding white. And also I like the kind of neutral gray that you get when you mix black and white together, you get a lovely kind of neutral gray. You can get almost the same effect just by using black and lots and lots of water. But then obviously the issue is you're using lots and lots of water. Okay, now what I'm gonna do, with something which I haven't yet done, I just keep tapping this phone all the time. I'm gonna start using some really nice dark black tones now, just to let this pop a little bit. Lost a little bit of the flag there, but that doesn't matter. Ian, I was watching one of your demos and you were going through your sketchbook and talking about a sketch that you made in Amsterdam. And you were talking yeah. about how wonderful it was because this woman brought you tea and cakes while you were out there working. So yeah. can you tell us some of your other memorable experiences while you were out sketching the world? Okay, <laughs> like so. So many of them. Um, I, I was in Amsterdam. It was the same trip that you just referred to. And I was in um, I was in, in Amsterdam. It was the first day I arrived for a kind of sketching, a little sketching trip that I was doing and meeting up with some friends. And I was drawing um, one of the bridges, one of the many, many thousands of bridges they have in Amsterdam um, on Prinsengracht. And I was sitting on the floor leaning up against a tree. And this lovely, lovely Dutch lady came over and just started chatting to me and asking me what I was doing. And she had this little dog, this little cute dog. I think it was a little Yorkie Terrier. And he wasn't interested in what I was doing. He was more interested in the tree that I was leaning on. And he cocks his leg and he has a pee against the tree. And like all the way is like running down the tree. And some of it kind of landed, you know, right next to my paint. And so as I'm talking to her, I'm really mindful that I don't dip my brush in this like dog way. Otherwise it was gonna, you know, create the most bizarre color in the sketch. And that was the first day I arrived in Amsterdam. 
so funny. And I couldn't tell her she was so sweet and nice and saying so many lovely things about my drawing that I didn't dare tell her, look, excuse me, but your dog's just peed all over my paints. That was really funny. So you never funny. know what's going to happen out there. And the thing is, Heather, if, you know, if you're working in a studio from a photograph, like the chances of that happening are pretty remote, aren't they? They are, you would think. You'd hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We have a question. Um, someone is wondering, what are your favorite types of brushes and why? Okay, I use um, my brushes, I use Pro Arti. And I kind of always use Pro Arti and I just, I love them. I love them to bits, they're great. So the ones that I showed you before, the um, flat ones, they're all, they're all Pro Arti. And I just like the feel of them, I like the strength of them. They're just really nice brushes. And the rig are the same as well so they're quite robust and tough they're tough tough cookies and i really like them and this is fun i am loving this Okay, so I'll do a little bit more lettering now. Now this pen, I want, just want to show you this pen, guys. This is a, um, a Mitsubishi Uniball, and it's a broad pen. This is like the Arnold Schwarzenegger of pens. This bad boy will draw over anything at all. It's like, it's like a commando pen. It's brilliant. I love it. So it's a Uniball. So it's not like the Derwent Fine Liners, which are lovely and soft, but, you know, they just give up on, on this. They've, been, they've given up by now on this paint. But it's great when you want some really strong, thick lines and you don't want it to give up because there's a little bit of moisture or something on the, on the page. Another question, Ian. Uh, someone wants to know, the riggers Ian uses, are they for acrylic because they are longer? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they are well spotted. Yeah, they're actually acrylic. I've tried the watercolour ones, but they're just not as good. They they just don't have the same strength to them. And obviously the way I paint, because I'm just really kind of throwing, throwing the stuff around, um, I need the brushes to be quite tough, really. Okay, I'm gonna get some more lettering in now with a fine liner. So let's get some of these places in. This is exciting. I love this. So Barstow. No idea where Barstow is. I guess it's California. So Barstow is that way. Now Oatman, I've heard of Oatman. That's where they've got all the mules wandering around. So there's Oatman. And we've got Tulsa. I've probably got the signs going the wrong way, but I don't care. That really isn't important. <laughs> So 24 hours to Tulsa, and then is this the way to Amarillo? This is just so cool. Makes a change from signs that say Liverpool and Chester. Okay, Lincoln. There's Lincoln. And we'll have Joplin at the top. There's Joplin. So we kind of swap those around a little bit, and I'll come, I'll come back to those. And then we've got caution. We've got watch out for low flying aircraft and we've got airplane rides i wouldn't like to go for a ride in this airplane airplane rides ian we're getting a few questions about the pen can you clarify the information about that pen please which one uh i believe the ones you're using the right this this is this is a liner this is a line maker this one here this is a Mitsubishi Uniball. Um, it's a broad one, so it's got like more of a kind of roller, roller nib, whereas this is more of a, of a fiber, fiber nib. So this is finer. This is broader. This will give you lovely kind of soft, subtle, delicate lines. This one you can plow a field with it. It's like so tough. Is that why you, it's called the Arnold Schwarzenegger? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but don't go into a shop and ask for an Arnold Schwarzenegger pen because they'll, they'll just look at you as if, you know, what are you talking about? 
I, I just call it the Arnold Schwarzenegger one because it's just so robust and tough and they never give up. And they're not, they're not expensive either. But you see, the thing about materials is it's a very, very personal thing. You know, I mean, I don't say to people, you've got to use a certain brand of paint or you've got to use a certain type of brush. And um, I mean, some, you know, some people really want to try and use the same materials that I use, but I don't think it, it really matters, matters hugely because it's more about your vision and what you see and how you record it and the shapes that you use and the stories that you tell. You know, to me, that's, that's the most important thing. And I think also the, the size of the paper as well, you know, the size of the paper has to be big to kind of fit everything on because we're drawing a lot of, a lot of stuff in quite a de detailed way. do love all of these signs, they're just great. We have a question from Natalie, who says, Ian, do you always work on 30 by 40 centimeter, or do you sometimes take square, panoramic formats, larger or smaller ones? Not really. No, I pretty much always work 30 by 40. Um, I do have, I do have a, a square sketchbook, um, which I sometimes use for the vehicle sketches. So if you've seen me do any of the kind of the junkyard sketches of the old vehicles and the old tractors, they're sometimes done on a kind of a square format, but mo mostly I do everything 30 by 40. And I don't, I don't do panoramas. I mean, unless it's a commission, I do kind of loads of, you know, commissions for galleries and commercial things like that. So then I might do a, a panorama, but not really, no, because you see, mo again, most of the stuff is done outside on location. So a, a 30 by 40 format just kind of suits, suits that. And then we have a question from Jolie, who is watching live on Facebook. How do you know when it's done, when you are finished, when right. okay. touching? Because you, I suppose that the simple answer is you've kind of, you've drawn everything, you know, you've told the story that you can tell and there's no more stories left. You've kind of drawn everything. Now with this particular sketch, with this demo, because it's only, it's only an hour and a half and it's gonna take me at least another hour to finish. What I will do is I'll probably finish it off later and I'll post it. I'll send a copy over to you, Heather. And you know, if you want, you can share it on your um, social media and your websites. And I'll also post it on mine as well. So you will see, you'll see it finished because I won't get it finished in this time. I'll get most of it done in this time, but I won't get it all done. So you know when it's finished really when everything's been drawn. Now at the moment, this isn't even halfway through. I've got so much more I need to do, but I've got the kind of the essence of it done. You know, I've got all the composition and I've got all the tonal values in. And I'm just starting to pick up on the detail, but there's still a lot more detail. I need to do. So what would be good for people to see is the actual finished one and you'll see the difference between what it looks like now and what it looks like when it's complete. But it's great fun. I'm just I'm loving doing this. It's like because I've never drawn anything like this before. 
I'm going to do some chunky lettering here. Love chunky lettering. See, like this. It's just great. Fantastic. Love that. I do get very excited about lettering. This is really fun, Ian, and we're so excited to have you at two of our three locations in the next year. We've got you on Madeline Island in July, and we have you in Santa Fe in March. Of course, we have one more location in Tucson, Arizona. I'll show you some pictures of that in a little bit. But we're thrilled to see what you can capture from two of our three locations. And that's, that's the magic of it, Heather, isn't it? You know, when you go over to, to somewhere, you don't quite know what you're going to find. And that's what it's all about. And it's the same with the students. You know, I know what I'm going to teach. I know how I'm going to break it down, how I'm going to explain it, how I'm going to make it fun. But you just don't know what the stories are. And everyone's got their own story to tell. So if I was teaching this as a workshop now, everybody's picture would be different. You know, they'd all be different because it'd be their picture and it'd be things that they see. So they might exaggerate certain signs. They might see things that I don't see. Um, and that's what makes it magical. That's why it's so cool to do. So Ian, for those that arrived late, um, just wondering if you could tell us again about your fascination with Route 66. Okay, all right. Um, it's, I suppose it's not just Route 66. I mean, like a lot of people, I grew up watching, you know, American films, a lot of American films. And it's, it's that fascination, I think, just with Americana. But the same thing applies with lo lots of, you know, lots of places that you go to. You, you just, you're interested in the culture. You're interested in the history. You're interested in the stories. And then it's the stories that you can tell as well. And somewhere like this, I'm just trying to draw a plane. It's looking a bit like a spaceship. Never mind. There we go. Um, the stories you tell are based on what you think is interesting and visually interesting. And somewhere like this has got so many brilliant stories, you know, to do with history and culture. And it's all there. And that's why I just think it's great. And something like this just acts as a kind of a backdrop to all of that. So Ian Graham would like to know, what is your favorite Western? Wow, okay, that's, that, I really appreciate that question as well because that's, that's like Megan's question before about my um, favorite Bruce Springsteen song. It's an easy one to answer. Um, it used to be, and it might still be, um, The Good, The Bad, The Ugly. Um, I just, I mean, I know that's a spaghetti Western and it was filmed in Europe and it's, you know, it's not a kind of, wasn't filmed in America, but I, I just, I love that. It's great. So, so many great characters in the music's amazing. The shootout at the end's amazing. It's got Clinton, got a great cast. Um, so I love, I love that film. So yeah, I'd say probably The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. As I'm drawing at the moment, I'm quite mindful that I'm not smudging any of the paint because some of the paint is still a little bit on the wet side. So I've just got to be quite, quite careful that it doesn't get smudged too much. I have a lovely message from you from Natalie. She said, not a question, but thank you so much, Ian, for diluting Corona-induced doom and gloom by doing these demos and workshops and cheering up all our lives. I attended oh, one of your live so ones, and now I see that you're as cheerful, which makes me hopeful for all Corona madness. Oh, that's so lovely. Was that Natalie? That is Natalie, yes. 
Natalie, I will pay you later for that, sweetheart. Okay, just let me know how much I owe you. All right. It's such a lovely thing to say. Now, what I'm doing at the moment, I'm thickening up some of the lines on the lettering. And the reason I'm doing this, it's a bit of a stylization, but it just helps to link it in better with the picture. So these thick lines that I'm just starting to, to draw, they, they're just linking better with kind of other parts of the other parts of the picture. We'll do some of this now. Let's do bubbly writing on this one. So Ian, we all know you're such a fan of lettering. Do you ever? Do an urban sketch of a, a building where there isn't lettering and you add your own? No, oh no, I'd, I'd never do that, no. I'd only ever draw kind of what's there. I, I wouldn't add extra lettering, no, no. Um, because it kind of wouldn't, it wouldn't really make sense for me, Heather. Do you, do you know what I mean? You, you kind of, you draw what's there and you edit things, you play with things, you play with the lettering style. You know, sometimes I play with the, the spelling as well, you know, if I can't, if I have to misspell it to fit it on, I'll do that. And I think that's great fun. And I'm really playing with this lettering now on the espresso. And I'm going to come back and really mess around with these later. But I wouldn't add something in. I wouldn't put something that kind of wasn't there because it just wouldn't, it wouldn't really make sense. It's a bit like you know, the colouring on this. If I didn't do this a cobalt turquoise light and a cerulean blue, it, it kind of like begs the question, why are you doing it? You know, it's a very, very specific dominant colour, which is in some ways, I guess, quite iconic of, of this particular building, I'm guessing. So, you know, if you don't do it, that colour, why, why have you bothered? So on Madeline Island, Ian, we have a place called Tom's Burn Down Cafe. And you'll see- I've in the heard of that. I've heard yes. of it, yeah. And I actually I have an it. urban sketch done by Sherry Blockhoff that's going to be in our, our short little slideshow a bit later. But you might need to bring a whole host of pens just to get all the lettering that you'll find at Tom's. It's wow, can't wait. I've seen, yeah, I've seen pictures of that, Heather. It looks amazing. It, it does, is. it looks stunning. Can't wait. Can't wait. Right, I'm just gonna flick this round again because I just wanna strengthen some of these because obviously I'll put a wash on them. I just want to strengthen some of these lines here. We have a question from Penny. What order of drawing do you start with? Background, foreground, or midground? Well, it depends. It, it really depends on, on, on the subject, but I don't think in those terms because what I'm doing is I'm just sketching the space. So it's everything. Everything gets drawn all at once. Everything's fitting together on the same space, if you like. So I'm not mindful of the background and bringing it forward and putting the middle ground in the middle because it just doesn't work like that because it's essentially a drawing that you're colouring in. And you're also just letting the, 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 the colour have a life of its own. So sometimes I might think in those terms. It depends on the subject. If I'm doing something with a lot more space, a lot more depth in it, I might think in those terms. But something like this, everything is really flat because it's all happening on the same plane. So, yeah, great, great question. Really good question. These pens, I'll just show you what you can do with these pens if you haven't used them before. You put a black tone on like that and then you just get a lighter one and you can just blend it in, say. Just add a little bit of weight to the vehicle, which is quite cool. Now, Heather, how long have we got? I'm just conscious of time. Can't believe it's gone so quickly. It really is. I know you, you want to keep to the end. Yeah. So I'm when do you want me to fun. When do you want when do you want me to stop? Well, we have 10 minutes remaining in our 90 minute demonstration here. And I'll only take, oh, maybe three or four of those minutes. My, my spiel will be short and quick and then we can hand it back to you to talk.
talk about those classes you're teaching with us. Okay, so if I stop in about two or three minutes. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. Okay. Let's do J2. And Ian, Natalie would like to know, will you be offering another demo or when is the next demo? <laughs> I haven't even finished this one yet, Natalie. I'm still doing this one. <laughs> um, well, we haven't got any, any, anything scheduled at the moment, um, but I'm sure there will be more. And just, just look out for them on, on social media, on my Instagram account or, you know, on any of the websites that um, you follow. So, um, but we haven't got anything planned at the moment, but I'm sure, I'm sure there will be. But these things are great to do. I mean, and it's a real privilege for me to do it. I love doing them so much and just, you know, knowing that there's, there's people there who hopefully are kind of enjoying it and getting a lot out of it and, you know, watching the kind of mess, the mess that I make, because it's just great fun. despite the fact that my phone keeps going off. As you're kind of finishing up here, Ian, I just want to say thank you from all of your viewers here. You're getting a lot of praise and gratitude coming your way for spending your time doing this. And from all of us at MISA, we really thank you as well for giving us this time. It's just a pure joy to watch. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you, Heather. And thank you for hosting it as well. You've been lovely. Oh, well, thank you. It's my pleasure. Yeah, so if I could just um, just repeat something I said before, um, I will spend quite a bit more time on this and I'll post it on social media so you'll get a chance to see the completed one. And I'll also make sure I send a copy over to you guys as well. Right, last little bit, just do a little bit of texture down here. Just a few little stones. Can't quite see the stones, but I'm sure they're there. And this is an example of kind of what I would do if I was on location. So someone asked the great question before about the difference between working on location and working from a photo. Working on location, you would really look and scan the scene and look for things, look for details and reference and things that, you know, are going to kind of bring the thing to life, which are difficult from a photograph because there's a limited amount of information. But you know, in reality, there would be lots of little stones and little cracks in the pavement that you can really observe on location. Like there's a crack going all the way down here, which I've only just noticed, look at that. Fantastic. Let's do another one. We have a question from Tarini for you. Do you do online classes? This uh, viewer is from the Middle East. I do, I do lots and lots of online classes. Um, and the best thing is just to keep looking out on my Instagram accounts, because that's kind of where they get advertised. But yeah, I, I do, I do a lot of 
online stuff at the moment because because they won't let me travel anywhere they won't let me go out hopefully i'll be able to soon definitely in july when i come over to america okay last little thing and then i promise i promise her that i will stop see this is the trouble you, you don't want to stop Someone said before, you know, when do you know when to stop? Well, you stop when it's finished. <laughs> it's, it's finished at the moment, and I want to keep going and going and going. <laughs> I understand. It's so it's mesmerizing to watch. We're all enjoying it very much. Oh, thank you. In fact, one of your viewers, uh, Patrice, said thank you for the wonderful demonstration. It's a world of color in one photo, and you captured it well. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you so much. It's really nice and kind. Okay, so I think I'll stop at that point, Heather, because the trouble is, if I don't stop now, I'll be drawing for the next like hour and everyone's going to start getting really annoyed with me because they're probably going to go want to go off and do some online shopping. So that is kind of a very speeded up version of what I would do on a workshop. OK, that's like four hours condensed into about an hour and 15 minutes, plus with my camera phone switching off all the time as well, which has been a bit of a distraction. <laughs> well, it's just lovely. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. So if if you would all humor me, I'd like to take a few minutes to show you a little bit about Misa. And then we'll get back to Ian. All right. So let's see. Okay, so this is the 543 information about MISA. So five, we offer five day workshops for adults in four different genres, which are writing, painting, fiber arts, and photography in three different locations. So MISA started on Madeline Island, which is the largest and only year round inhabited of the 22 Apostle Islands. The school has been offering workshops with world-renowned instructors like Ian for a decade and is considered to be one of the top ranked art schools in the country. The privately owned 80 Acres is an hour and a half from the nearest airport and then a quick ferry boat ride on the beautiful Lake Superior. And once students arrive, island time begins. Highlights of this location include a boat cruise to the famous sea caves, north facing spacious studios, unique local scenery, but like Tom's Burn Down Cafe captured here by Sherry Blackhoff, Lake Superior hikes, sandy beaches, and lagoons. Our nearby picturesque port town of Bayfield, Wisconsin is shown here and was captured by your buddy, Jim Richards. To extend our workshop season and provide more diverse settings, Mesa started two additional locations in the Southwest. We offer workshops at a large, large and luxurious dude ranch outside of Tucson, Arizona called the Tanka Verde Ranch. This location borders the Saguaro National Park and features 180 ranch horses, a famous cowboy cookout, and sweeping views of the Rincon Mountains. Our third campus is located downtown Santa Fe, a few blocks from the historic plaza. This location offers endless restaurants and galleries, trips to local museums, including the International Folk Art Museum and the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum, and historical architecture captured beautifully by Mr. Ian Fennelly himself. Mesa is working to add additional locations in the upcoming years, one in Ojai, California, and then we are searching for the ideal setting in the Northeast. We truly hope you will consider taking one of our workshops for the full MISA experience. Thank you so much for letting me gush about the famous Madeline Island School of the Arts. Please check out our website, www.madelineschool.com to find out more. 
and join our newsletter list and check out our Facebook page and our Instagram. And again, we have classes taught by Ian Fennelly coming up July 19th to the 23rd on Madeline Island and March 21st through the 25th of 2022 in Santa Fe. You can find links to those in our chat. And just a reminder, this video will be available on YouTube shortly, and we have gone live on Facebook, so you can see it there as well. Ian, thank you again so much, and you're still working away there. I just love that. You can't stop. I thought you were gonna tell me off then, Heather. I was gonna say, <laughs> Ian, put your pen down, pay attention. It's my oh, time now, never. watch the video. <laughs> <laughs> you just keep right on going. I could watch this all day long. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Can I just thank everybody for joining us? Please. It's been lovely knowing that you're all out there. And thank you for all the lovely little comments that you've been pinging up. And there's been some great questions as well. I really appreciate the questions, especially the one from Megan about um, my favourite Bruce Springsteen song. That was great. I love that. It's, that was such an easy one to answer. <laughs> but hopefully, guys, this has just been a, a, a bit of a flavour of, of what I what I do, my, my process. And I'm sure quite a few of you out there have maybe seen it before. So this is a kind of fast forwarded version of, of what I what I do. But I've really enjoyed doing it. I love what I do. I love urban sketching and meeting people and going off around the world and just, you know, finding stories, finding your own story. It's great. It's magical. Wonderful. Well, it's magical the way you capture those stories and we look forward to seeing you on Madeline Island and in Santa Fe to see what you'll capture here. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Ian. Thank you. And everybody have a wonderful day and we hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye now. Okay, bye everyone, take care, bye bye.